Welcome to Gladeville United Methodist Church. We are so glad that you are worshiping with us this morning. The choir will bring us into worship. Thank you. Our opening hymn this morning is Come We That Love the Lord. Please stand as we sing. Our responsive reading this morning is Psalm 34, verses 1 through 8 and 19 through 22. It's on page 769 of your United Methodist hymnal. I will bless the Lord at all times. God's praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul makes its boast in the Lord. Let the afflicted hear and be glad. O oh, magnify the Lord with me, and let us exalt God's name together. I sought the Lord who answered me, and delivered me from all my fears. Look to God, and be radiant, to your faces shall never be ashamed. The poor cried out to the Lord save them out of all their troubles. The angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear God and delivers them. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Happy are those who take refuge in God. Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers them. The Lord keeps all their bones. Not one of them is broken. Evil shall slay the wicked, and those who hate the righteous will be condemned. The Lord redeems the life of his servant. None of those who take refuge in God will be condemned. Please continue standing for the glory, Patre. Glory. 
be seated. We are going to prepare our hearts to go to the Lord in prayer. Please remember the situation and the people that we have lifted up in our hearts this morning. Take some deep breaths and let's breathe God in and just breathe everything out that we have drug in here with us this morning as we go to the Lord in prayer. O oh God, rich in mercy, you so loved the world that when we were dead in our sins, you sent your only Son for our deliverance. Lifted up from the earth, he is light and life, exalted upon the cross. Raise us up with Christ and make us rich in good works that we may walk as children of the light toward the paschal feast of heaven. Gracious God, fill us with the light of Christ that we may live as you want us to live. Lord, you formed us for your glory. Forgive the discontent which has risen in your church. Forgive us. Let your light shine before us that all eyes are lifted to see the salvation of the cross. Give us hearts for, to long for you and grace to discern you and courage to proclaim you. Lord, you have heard the cries and you have borne our pain and suffering on the cross. Strengthen our faith that you are always with us just as you promised. Make us bearers of good news to the poor, comfort to the brokenhearted, freedom to the captives, and light to those in darkness. Lord, as we travel through this day, we ask that you would please just comfort the hearts of those who are grieving, those who, have, who are not just grieving for loss of loved ones by death, but our grieving relationships, our grieving situations. And Lord, we lift up to you in joy the things that you are doing for us. I think about yesterday, Lord, and comforting and ministering to that family. I think about all the work that the willing hands do for the community and also for those within our, our own church community. I thank you for those who are willing to go, go beyond what is expected. I thank you, Lord, for, for Mike and Rick and, and what they are doing for that family in our, in our congregation. Lord, we are full of joy. We are full of hope. We are full of praise for you this morning. Forgive us when we aren't the people or the church that we should be. Hear our prayers for all things. And Lord, we give back to you now the prayer that you taught us to pray when we say together, Our Father, who art in heaven, be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against you. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. I would ask the choir to, to lift our prayers that we just did up to God when they are going to sing, Breathe on me, breath of God.
take our prayers to heaven. We've come to a time in our service where we give back to God a portion of what he's given to us with our gifts and tithes and offerings if our ushers would come. <coughs> Please stand for the doxology. Gracious God, take these gifts and tithes and offerings that have been presented. Bless the giver and the gift. Amen. Thank you, choir.
Our scripture reading for this morning is John 3, verses 14 through 21, and Bonnie is going to lead us in that. Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, so that the Son of Man must be lifted up, that everyone who believes may have eternal life in him. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe stands condemned already, because they have not believed in the name of God's one and only Son. This is the verdict. Light has come into the world, but people love darkness instead of light because of their deeds, because their deeds were evil. Everyone who does evil hates the light and will not come into the light for fear that their deeds will be exposed. But whoever lives by the truth comes into the light, so that it may be seen plainly that what they have done has been done in the sight of God. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. Amen. I love the Gospel of John. We, we are doing in our Bible study, we're, we're studying first and sec, first, second, and third John. Um, but the Gospel of John is, is just, it's just one of my favorite books. And much of the time in the Gospel of John, we find Jesus using just the simplest everyday analogies to teach us those spiritual truths that he wants us to know. He told stories, parables. So folks would relate to what he was saying. And I just think it's fascinating to hear all these parables, to listen to the teaching of Jesus, and, and it helps us to know and to, to just love deeper. He always seems to know what image to use, what story, what comparison to, to use to teach his listeners. And he teaches in some of the most common everyday objects like serpents and penguins and a wooden cross. Of course, he never mentioned those penguins, but that's a side thing I want to share with you today. Well, think about this. When Jesus passes through Samaria and encounters the woman at the well, which is one of my favorite stories, we find him striking up a woman with whom he appears to have very little in common. He's a, he's a Jew, she's a Samaritan. He's a man, she's a woman. But it turns out to be the longest recorded conversation between two people in the Bible. And while he's talking to her, he wants a drink, and so she gives him water, and then he turns to her and he says, you know what? I am the water that you need. And whoever drinks the water that I give them will never thirst. So we're talking about water here. Very simple, water. And then later on, if you remember, on down the road, he feeds 5,000 people with what? What does he use? Five loaves of what? And how many fish? And how many people? Yeah, and everybody eats their fill, and the disciples gather up 12 baskets of leftovers, almost as much as we had yesterday from that meal. And with that image of that overflowing baskets of bread still fresh in their mind, he says, and I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never be hungry. And still, as you keep reading in John, and he's walking down the road one day, and he sees this man who has been born, born blind. 
and he's lived his entire life in darkness. And just before Jesus heals him, Jesus says, I am the light of the world. And then he touches this blind man's eyes and removes the darkness. You see, most of the time, Jesus can get his message across with, with simplicity, with simple analogies, water, bread, light, all used to reveal of who he is. And in the Gospel of John, it's as if Jesus is saying, you could start at any point in the universe, pick any spot, and it will lead to me. But sometimes people don't get it. Sometimes Jesus has to use unusual images to make his point. And that's kind of what's happening when our text begins today. Jesus is in the middle, if you go on and, and read before you get to our text today. He's in this middle of, of a discussion with Nicodemus. Now, Nicodemus, as you probably know, maybe you don't, it was a Pharisee who has come to learn more about Jesus. And what time of day does he come? He comes at night. Yes, he does. Now, we're not sure why Nicodemus came. Maybe it was that Nicodemus was in that stage of his life where he just, he needed to know more. Things weren't going well. He, he had this spiritual hunger, a gnawing away at the inside that you just can't identify. People do that. They just know they're hungry for something, even if they can't quite put their finger on it. They know that they want something more. They need something more. It's kind of like my grandson Kyle, who just turned 17 this week, standing at the refrigerator with the door open in the middle of the night going, you know, I'm hungry, but I just don't know what I want. And he's such a picky eater, there's probably only two things in there that he'd eat anyway. But Nicodemus comes. He comes seeking. He comes wanting to know more about Jesus. Jesus has used the image of, of new birth. He must be born again. But Nicodemus doesn't get it. And then Jesus compares the spirit to the wind, blowing wherever he chooses, accomplishing God's purpose with a sense of freedom. Nicodemus doesn't get it. So finally, Jesus turns to an Old Testament story to make the point. I want to read that to you. It's found in Numbers. If you have your book or your phone or your Bible or whatever and you'd like to look it up, it's Numbers 21, and I'm going to start with verse 4 and, and read to, um, to verse 9. From Aunt Mount, Mount Hor, they, they set out by the way of the Red Sea to go around the land of Edom, but the people became impatient on the way. Imagine that. The people spoke against God and against Moses. Why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there is no food, no water, and we detest this miserable food. That's talking about the manna. Then the Lord sent poisonous serpents among the people, and they bit the people so that many Israelites died. And the people came to Moses and said, We have sinned by speaking against the Lord and against you. Pray to the Lord to take away these serpents from us. So Moses prayed for the people. And the Lord said to Moses, Make a poisonous serpent and set it on a pole. And everyone who is bitten shall look at it and live. Now, in your, I told you, in your insert, you got a picture of this snake on a pole. Or as my son used to say when I would preach this, there was a snake on a stick. So Moses made a serpent of bronze and put it up on a pole. And whenever a serpent bit someone, that person would look at the serpent of bronze and live. Israel had sinned. There was grumbling. They grumble about Moses. They grumble about God, they grumble about what they had to eat. They just grumble, grumble, grumble. And so part of their punishment was to be snake bitten. 
And the Israelites, of course, cried out to God for deliverance. And so God used the strangest thing to save them. It's that snake on a stick. And it was hoisted up, and when they looked at it, they were healed. They were, they were saved. But see, God can use anything to accomplish his purposes. Just as the serpent was lifted up in the wilderness, and so the man of son of God will be lifted up, crucified and glorified. You see, God can use anything, and he does, to bring about salvation. He can take the ordinary, and he makes it extraordinary anything and he offers us all of this to bring people to salvation to know him last saturday <coughs> i was going through some of my books at, at the parsonage in the um in the my parsonage office i have three bookshelves there and they're they're pretty full and so i was trying to to get some so i could i could give them away and I found Donald Miller's book. It is called Blue Like Jazz. Any of y'all ever heard of it? It's been a long time. It was out probably, came out probably eight or 10 years ago. And I read that book when it came out because I was just wonderful. It was before I was appointed here, of course. And in that book, as I was flipping through it, I remembered this part. Miller recounts a conversation with his friend Tony. And he says, you know what has really helped me understand why I believe in Jesus, Tony. And Tony says, well, what's that? And Miller says, penguins. Tony looks at him and goes, penguins? Yeah, penguins, said Donald. And then he went on to describe the life cycle of, of penguins to his friend. The females lay the eggs, and then they turn them over to the males. And the females leave, traveling for days back to the ocean where they jump in and they go fishing. And all the males are left in an enormous circle tending to these eggs. And they huddle together for warmth. And they kind of rotate the, the circle so none of them will be, be on the um, outside all the time. And the males are sitting on these, these eggs for a month when the females make their way back. And right when they do, almost to the day, these eggs are always hatched. Tony was not exactly sure that he understood this analogy, so Donald explains himself. The penguins have this radar inside them that told them when and where to go and that even though none of it made any sense, but they show up on the very day their babies are born. And the radar always turns out to be right. I have a radar inside me, he said, that says, believe in Jesus. Somehow, penguin radar leads them perfectly well. And maybe it isn't so foolish that I follow the radar that is inside of me. So what kind of God do we serve? We serve a God who can use serpents and penguins and all manner of things to, to bring people to himself. We serve a God who can use any event in our lives to bring about salvation. You see, that Holy Spirit will get you and surprise you every time. But in these days, Jesus announces, in these days, salvation only comes through me. The Father has sent me, the Son, to bring about salvation. That's the only way salvation occurs. God can use anything that he desires to bring about salvation of the world. And he has chosen Jesus Christ. God can use any event and use anything, any turning point in your life, in anybody's life. But salvation comes through Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Hear the good news. 
Your name is on the list of people Christ has come to save. Your name, the name of those guys working on that building over there, their name, your neighbor's name, the kids down the road's name, and they're your name and their name is on that list the day you were born. Even one, everyone God has created is names on that list of people that Christ came to save. It says right there in John 3, 16, for God, and, and Bonnie read it to us. He came for who? For everybody, for the world. Not the Western Hemisphere or the Southern Hemisphere. He came for everyone. We divide people into categories, so many categories. You got Americans, you got foreigners. You got white, you got black. You got male, you got female. You got Yankees, you got Southerners. You got Anglos, you got Hispanics. You got rich, you got poor. You got beautiful, you got homely. You got productive, you got worthless. But God doesn't have that list. If you were on the earth, you qualify for salvation. I think people forget that. There's no debate, no discussion, no waiting period, no application to fill out. Every person born is added to God's list. Christ comes into our world shining the light, looking for us. Christ has come to seek you out. It takes a long time for some people to hear that good news. Some people that have the idea that Christ has come saying, I've got a message for you, boy, from my father, and he's upset. To those who would rather live in darkness, to those who are hiding from God, for folks who are running from God, the light is a nuisance. An encounter with Christ makes them feel that they've been caught at something. Fred Craddock, who is one of my favorite teachers, tells the story of his father, and I love this, I love this, who spent years of his life hiding from God. And God kept after him. God was seeking him out. And this is what Dr. Credick says in one of his books. When the pastor used to come from my mother's church to call on him, meaning his father, my father would say, you don't care about me. I know how churches are. You want another pledge, another name, right? Another name, another pledge. That's the whole point of church. Get another name, another pledge. And my nervous mother would run to the kitchen crying for fear someone's feelings would be hurt. Anytime we had an evangelistic campaign or revival, the pastor would bring the evangelist, introduce him to my father, and then say, sick him, get him, sick him, get him. My father would always say the same thing. You don't care about me. Just another name, another pledge, another name, another pledge. I know about churches. Credit goes on to say, and I guess I heard that a thousand times, and one day he didn't say it. He was at the veterans hospital, and he was down to 71 pounds. They'd taken out his throat, put in a metal tube, and said, Mr. Craddock, you should have come earlier but this cancer is awfully far advanced. We'll give radium, but we don't know. Craddock said, I went to see him. And in every window in his hospital room were potted plants and flowers. Everywhere there was a place to set them, potted plants and flowers. Even in that thing that swings over your bed that they put food on, there was a big flower and there was a stack of cards 10 or 15 inches deep. And I looked at the cards sprinkled in with the flowers, and I read the cards beside his bed. 
And I want to tell you, every card, every blossom, every potted plant from that group, from the Sunday school classes, women's group, youth group, men's Bible class, were of my mother's church, every one of them. My father saw me reading them, and he couldn't speak. But he took a Kleenex box and wrote something on the side from Shakespeare's Hamlet. He wrote on the side, in this harsh world, draw your breath in pain to tell my story. He said, I turned to, to my father and I said, what's your story, daddy? And he wrote, I was wrong. It's not until you know God is seeking you in love, not in condemnation. It is not until that moment that the gospel becomes God's good news for you. You know, I have seen this and I often wondered why people stood at, at, at football games and, and had on, on big pieces of, of paper signs that had John 3.16 on them. And I used to think, why do they think that's going to help? Don't they know that, how are people going to be saved? I mean, why are they doing that? But then I had second thoughts about it. If God can use bronze serpents, penguins, and an old wooden cross, that maybe a cardboard sign isn't such a far-fetched idea after all. And if God truly desires that the whole world be saved, maybe getting this message out any way that you can might just be a good thing for those who are lost. Christ has come searching. And for those who are in darkness, the light is shined. And everyone who believes in Christ will have eternal life. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for this morning and this day. We thank you that you love the world. You loved all of us. You love all of us, and you're seeking us out. And you will use whatever is necessary, whether it's a bronze snake on a stick or penguins or an old wooden cross. And Lord, you can even use us. How strange sometimes we think about that. We thank you. We love you. We give you honor, praise, and glory in all things. In your blessed name we pray. Amen. Our hymn of sending forth is Je one. Jesus Keep Me Near the Cross. Please stand as we sing.
benediction. Go in peace, remembering whose you are and whom you serve. And that God loves you more than the sun and the stars. Amen and amen. Thank you.